Good afternoon. Today we shall be discussing John Goldsworthy's play Justice. Justice is a play that was written in written and staged in 1910 as a part of an artistic propaganda to improve the prison and penal conditions that was existing in England at that point in time. To go to the plot of Justice, the play as befits its title, opens in the office of a firm of solicitors, James and Walter Howe. One of the clerks in the firm, a young man named Holder, apparently has forged a check to get enough money to emigrate with the woman he loves, Ruth Honeyville, who is married to a drunken and violent man. As the plot progresses, we find that the forgery is discovered and after much debate between James Howe, his son Walter and their managing clerk Coxon, it is agreed that Falder must be prosecuted for his crime of forgery. The second act shows Falder's trial. The defense counsel tries to persuade the court that Falder was temporarily insane. Coxon Ruth Honeywell and Falder give evidence which seem to prove that, if not actually insane, he was certainly in a highly disturbed state of mind, jumpy, uh, as Coxon puts it. This is not felt to be enough reason uh, to excuse him. The prosecution stresses that Falder subsequently altered the counterforge in the checkbook to conceal his crime and in addition, the irregularity of his relationship with Ruth also goes against him. He is apparently sentenced to three years of penal servitude. In Act 3, the next act, we see that Coxon, who is concerned about Folder, visits the prison governor. He tries to impress on the governor and on the prison doctor and chaplain that the period of solitary confinement that Folder was undergoing might well damage Folder's physical and psychological health, but he is assured that Folder is being carefully watched, that there is no cause for worry, and that there are no abnormal signs of distress. His request that Ruth be allowed to visit the prison is refused. The second scene of the act takes place in the cell block. Several prisoners, including Folder, are interviewed by the governor, who is shown to be somewhat sympathetic and humane, but is nevertheless intent on doing the job which the law requires of him. The short third scene, without any dialogue, shows the mental agony which Folder is suffering in solitary confinement. The boredom and silence, and the darkness, and then suddenly the bright light are clearly affecting his mind and his mind's health. Uh, we get a very moving stage direction at this point in time, which I would like to quote. Goldsworthy says, A sound from far away, as of distant, full beating on thick metal, is suddenly audible. Folder shrinks back, not able to bear this sudden clamor, but the sound grows as though some great tumble were rolling towards the cell, and gradually it seems to hypnotize him. He begins creeping inch by inch nearer to the door. The banging sound traveling from cell to cell draws closer and closer. Folder's hands are seen moving as if his spirit is already joined in this beating, and the sound swells till it seems to have entered the very cell in which Folder was lodged. He suddenly raises his clenched fists, panting violently, he flings himself at his door and beats it. This is a stage direction that Goldsworthy feels seen at this point in time. It was the effect of this scene, incidentally, uh, that motivated the then new home secretary Winston Churchill, who happened to be England's prime minister later, 
to seek a further modification in the law which governed England's penal conditions, including solitary confinement. The last act of the play, once again set in the solicitor's office, takes place two years later and opens as did the first act with a scene between Cookson and Ruth, who has left her British husband in the meantime and has been forced by poverty to become a prostitute. She has, however, just met Falder, now on parole from prison and sleeping rough in the park, and has come to the solicitor's office to plead for his reinstatement as a clerk. Oakson and the partners are sympathetic. James's reservations about Ruth are dispelled when it is made clear that she now has grounds for divorce from her abusive husband and that she and Falder could eventually marry. Coxon, however, feels that he must reveal that Ruth has been living on immoral earnings, that is, earnings as a result of her profession as a prostitute. She agrees with James that she must give up any hope of continuing her relationship with Folder. The police officer who arrested Folder in Act 1 enters in search of him as he has failed to report to the police a condition of his parole. The partners and Cookson refuse to say that he is in the next room, but the detective discovers him. Faldo faced with another term in prison for jumping parole and the loss of fruit, jumps or falls out of the window and is killed. And the play ends. Now with regard to the title of the play, Justice, it is apparently very clear that for John Goldsworthy, the play is a heartrending tragedy and its central theme has been the suffering that is caused to individuals by the administration of criminal law. Folder, the hero of the play, apparently committed an act of forgery to save his beloved Ruth, who is continuously tortured by her husband. As her very life is in danger and moved by such a condition as hers, in pity, Folder plans to elope with her to South America. But as he has no money for it, he commits the crime of forging a check. He is branded as a criminal, though it is his first crime and a crime under compelling psychological circumstances. Neither the employers nor the law gave him a chance for rectification or purification as it were. He is sentenced to three years of rigorous imprisonment as we have known. His spiritual agony during this term of solitary confinement is vividly and realistically depicted by Goldsworthy. And since justice is one of the most powerful of the problem plays produced in Goldsworthy's time, uh, it is clear that Goldsworthy's main intention to this play was to focus on a number of social problems that arises out of the administration of justice uh, to commoners in England. The problem uh, of justice essentially focuses on the question as to what should a society do with a criminal like Folder who violates the laws of the society by in this case altering a check of his employers and misappropriating some money under compulsion. When Alter asks his father James to let Folder go for the sake of his future, James sarcastically replies, and I quote, according to you, no one would ever be prosecuted. To break the law like that, in here, nothing for it, prosecute." Unquote. At last, Folder comes out from jail and he forges a reference for securing a job and is incidentally rearrested and commits suicide. Clearly, therefore, the title is very much appropriate because it demonstrated the fallibility of the legal system of the land. There is no doubt that the play tells the story of life suffering and death of Folder, but the play also unmistakably indicates 
that there are uncountable folders in society who suffer similarly and meet almost, meet almost similar fate. For all these crucial reasons, we may conclude that the title of the plea, Justice, is both appropriate and suggestive as well as universal. Now to move to the main character that we are discussing in this plot, that is Folder. Folder is apparently a member of a society in England in the first couple of decades of the 20th century who would survive by working somewhere and clearly since the play is influenced by Goldsworthy's visit to a prison in Dartmoor in 1907, Goldsworthy perhaps felt that the abysmal penal conditions that was existing in England at that point in time could best be reinforced with a universal public message if one of the victims of the conditions is made to be a person whom a lot of individuals in Indian society would automatically associate themselves with. Folder is employed in an office, a solicitor's firm, which is very much which was very much true for lakhs and lakhs of uh, individuals in Gauls for this time. Folder is in love with a lady who happens to be married to an abusive husband which is an incident enough for Folder to work overtime as it were, or to get desperate to rescue her from her condition. And incidentally, Folder does not face his tragedy because of some hemashi or tragic flaw, as is the case with Greek heroes, tragic heroes. His only offense was an offense of a forgery by converting a 9 to a 90 by adding a 0. He did this not to harm anybody, but he wanted to save Ruth from the torture of a brutal husband. It's another matter altogether that this crime is discovered because before he could flee with Ruth and he is arrested and prosecuted. From this point in time of his arrest, the tragedy of the play begins as Mr. Fawn, the defense counsel, says in the trial scene, and I quote, the ruling of the chariot wheels of justice over this boy began when it was decided to prosecute him, unquote. Mark the words, chariot wheels. Goldsworthy was all along a realistic writer and he shows the problems of society and law through the tragedy of Folder. In the trial scene, for example, Mr. Fromm considers Folder as a patient, quote unquote, and not a criminal and compares justice to, again another quote, a machine that when someone has once given it the starting push, rolls on of itself, unquote. He also considers justice as a chariot, as we have known, the chariot wheels of justice, uh, which works unstoppably to finish the life of hold. According to him, men like the prisoners are destroyed daily under our law for want of that human insight, unquote. A conventional tragic hero suffers from this tragic flaw, but in the case of Folger, we find that he is not dominated as such by any flaws. Uh, he does not work in a momentary solace or, for example, in a moment of aberration. He at best is a weak-willed character, as Mr. Fromm says to the judge, bred and born with a weak character. These are the exact words that Fromm uses. He is a victim of some form of a malign force of society. Though Mr. Fromm pleads to the judge to look at Folder from a humanitarian point of view, Mr. Cleaver considers it as one of the most serious crimes known to our law and the judge agrees with him uh, when he says that the crime you have committed is a very serious one. And finally we find that Folder is sentenced to imprisonment. Interestingly, through the mute scene, Goldsworthy shows the deep-rooted agony of a prisoner during the time of his solitary confinement. 
Though the sin is without any dialogue, it is capable enough to arouse pity for folder and for the fear of the prison system and the prison administration. However, after two years of his release, he is ordered to report in the police station regularly. He apparently does not do it. Why he does not do it is something which we don't know. So he is again found out by Detective Sergeant Pister and he finally throws up his head and goes out to the outer office and surrenders to death and a dead silence swallows the situation. Thus, though Folder does not occupy any eminent place or higher state in the society that Goldsworthy portrays, his death evokes both pity and fear uh, in the minds of the audience and helps in bringing out the catharsis of his emotions. He clearly is not a conventional tragic hero, but is an important tragic hero in modern drama. Now to focus on the other important character that we have in this play, uh, some form of an antithesis to Falter, he is Coxon. John Goldsworthy, the humanitarian moralist, as people would call him, is very careful about the delineation of his characters as he thinks that character is the most important element of any play, playwright's dramatic technique. According to him, character is the foundation of the plot and he clearly feels that the plot is subservient to character. He opines, and I quote, the perfect dramatist rounds up his characters and facts within the ring fence of a dominant idea which fulfills the craving of his spirit. Take care of characters, also he says, the work will take care of itself. Unquote. At another place he says, and I quote, the dramatist who hangs his characters to his plot instead of hanging his plot to his characters is guilty of a cardinal sin. In all of his works, we find that Goldsworthy draws characters from his observation of persons around him in the society of his times. Justice, one of the most remarkable social tragedies and problem plays, is an exact specimen of Goldsworthy's urge to use art to focus on the society, its aberrations, with an aim to either remove them or at least ameliorate the sufferings of the people that he sees around him. He draws characters from common place like home, office, law courts, etc. In this play, Coxon plays a very important role, as I've just said, uh, to establish himself as some form of a dramatic antithesis to hold. We get to know that Coxon is a man of 60, wearing spectacles, rather short, with a bald head and an honest, bugged up face. He is a man full of humanity, sympathy, a strong sense of justice, a timid impartiality and generosity. Coxon is a law-abiding and disciplined person. He says about himself, and I quote, I am a plain man, never set myself against authority, unquote. His honesty is shown in the trial scene where he does not use a single word of his own. Rather, he quotes the exact words told by Ruth that for Folder, it is a matter of life and death. In the play Justice, Coxon essentially plays the role of the chorus uh, in a great drama. He is the character who introduces the most important characters of the play, uh, specifically Ruth and Folder. We find that he acts as the mediator and connects the characters of the play with the audience or the reader. And in this play, incidentally and interestingly, Coxon is the only person who provides an element of fun and humor. And the chief source of his humor is the misuse of words and their wrong pronunciation. For example, he uses the word neurotic for neurotic. He uses the Latin phrase why compose, but originally it is non compost mentis. He uses sine qua non for sine qua non, 
and prima facie for prima facie. Through the character of Coulson, Goldsworthy also shows the problem, problems of the society of his time. Firstly, when Ruth comes to visit Falder, Coulson firmly asserts, quote unquote, it's all against the rules. And then again he says, we don't allow private callers here. And when Falder kisses Ruth, he says, this isn't right. It's an improper use of these premises. Here he shows the hard rules of the solicitor's office. Again in Act 4 of the play, after the release of Folder from prison, when he comes to the office for a job or for a reinstatement of his original position, Coxon requests James and says that I am bound to tell you all about it. He, meaning Folder, is quite penitent, but there is prejudice against him. Prejudice because obviously he was a convict who is returning from prison. Actually, Goldsworthy here very authentically shows the problem of social and economic rehabilitation of prisoners after their release from the jail. Thus, Coxon's character is too important to, to avoid. Without Coxon, the plot of the play is not developed and the theme of the play is not established. He is the character who gives a start to the play and it ends with his remark where he says, commenting on the death of Walter. No one will touch him now, never again. He is safe with gentle Jesus. Though he is essentially a round character, to quote E.M. Foster, and remains the same throughout the play, he always acts under the stress of circumstances. And essentially his omnipotence is highlighted repeatedly by Goldsworthy. And Goldsworthy's social ambition that forms the fulcrum of the play is significantly realized through the character of Goldsworthy. So this is all that I have to tell you about John Goldsworthy's play, Justice.